Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to 1980s cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. My name's Dominic and joining me every week as usual is John and Jenna. And uh, before we like before we get started, we'd like to, you know, kind of talk about what's been going on in each other's lives. Start with you, John. How are things up there in the greater Seattle area? Things are going pretty good. Uh, been kind of enjoy- enjoying somewhat of a mild uh, section of the summer. Thankfully getting past the July 4th holiday and yeah. all of, uh, the place where I live it just goes crazy with fireworks and when you have a dog that's scared of fireworks it makes for a long weekend yeah and and i i remember that you know from when i lived up there and here in old people central in phoenix like everything's done by nine o'clock around here maybe there's a couple here and there but i remember being being out where you're at and it's like it's it's the closest thing I can describe it to is like a, is a fireworks war zone. Yeah, I and, and you know this was at our mom recently moved up here, and so this was the first Fourth of July she got to see. Just seeing how she, she, just seeing her reaction to how crazy it gets. I think anywhere in the United States, if you say like, "Oh, we have we go crazy with fireworks," I don't think you understand what that means. So you can come up and and see what the fireworks are like on fort lewis in washington yeah um because it is just insanity you can get any your hands on anything you want from the indian reservations and it is just like a week long us blowing crap up sounds like a war zone and it's just amazing uh we don't that Washington doesn't just burn down from all of the fireworks going off for the for the week of the fourth yeah, that's always that's always confused me. Jenna, how are things uh, going for you in the Bay Area? You know, things are they're good. I'm I'm on break from school, so that feels like uh, I have all this extra time in my life. Um, so I'm living it up by reading and wasting all of my time. But um, it's been it's been chasing a- Pokemon. <laughs> Yeah, like now now that I've embarrassingly spent just way too much time teaching myself how to catch Pokemon, I am doing my best to to catch them all, right? <laughs> um, but it's also been, it's just been a little bit crazy down here with all of the, the stuff going on nationally around um, Baton Rouge and things like that. So we have a number of people who I feel like uh, I've, I've been fortunate to come into contact with who've been very close to the things that are going on in baton rouge so trying to keep up with that yeah yeah well i mean all i can say following up those things is that it's summer in arizona and so i went out to take the trash out without putting my shoes on and i'm pretty sure i got third degree burns on the bottom of my feet <laughs> let's get started with this episode this is miami vice season one episode nine as we're calling it because we're still referring to the pilot as two separate episodes titled the great MacArthur," originally aired on november 16th 1984 uh and this we got a winner we got a winner of an episode in this one. So let's move on and talk, let's give a rundown on this show. This is the best episode so far. All right, guys. We've talked for weeks now about how great the openings are. And we kind of have a good opening here, but man, it's short. This is a short opening. We get right to the point. It's not one of those epic 15 minute long cold opens that, that we get for the show. And it doesn't need to be because we get someone important back. <laughs> the so, so it starts off with like Crockett's Ferrari comes driving up really fast, and so, so do the police. And Tubbs asks him like, "What's going on?" And Crockett tells him it's a bank robbery. And I just immediately thought like, "Does do New York police officers don't not deal with bank robberies? Do they not know anything about bank robberies?" And then my second thought was like, "Why are vice cops assisting in a bank robbery chase?" Oh, don't you know the entire see, police force is only made up of Crockett and Tubbs? They handle everything. <laughs> see, this is where my thought was: wasn't Tubbs in New York? Wasn't he part of robbery? Ho- uh, the robbery division. Oh yeah, that's right. He like almost explicitly did this. <laughs> yes, this was all he worked on. <laughs> Opening scene does make me wonder who is faster, Tubbs or Crockett. I'm pre- I'm pretty sure. I mean, Crockett played football, right? I mean, he's he's got to be. He, you, I would imagine he's faster. But he's a chain smoker and, and a yeah, heavy drinker. <laughs> that's true. That's true, but he's got, I guess, he's got pretty good sea legs. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I guess for me, what I what I was trying to figure out is based on watching them run, it definitely seems like Tubbs wears more of tennis shoes. Crockett's wearing some of the loafers. So yeah, I Tubbs think that gives like, Tubbs the edge, like those new Steph Curry shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like what he's rocking, like those, those New Balances or whatever. That they way, are. he can easily go from chasing robbery suspects to working at a nursing home. Well. <laughs> 
this this scene is important because they're 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 chasing this guy through. He's running through. It's like is a, is it an abandoned business park or mall? Yeah, I, I think it's like an abandoned business park. Yeah, yeah. So they're chasing him around and they finally corner him. And this is one of those times. And there's a couple times in this episode where Miami Vice thinks they can be funny, and and Miami Vice can't be funny. And I don't no know way. who these writers no way. are. They totally succeed. <laughs> oh, I strongly disagree. I thought this episode was uh, hilarious. <laughs> but it's hilarious for the wrong reasons. Not because the writers are funny, but because Touché. things are just awkward. And they so they they find him, yeah, they I... stop, and Crockett like bangs the you know, some metal pipe on the on the top of this metal thing, sheeting that's like hiding where the guy is hiding, and they pull it back. And underneath there is Trini DeSoto from the pilot. Literally, the only thing that could have been better about him popping up in this is if he had a wig and was trying to sell <laughs> fake hair. Uh, <laughs> so well, you might remember, yeah. you might remember Trino as the cross-dressing killer from the pilot. In this episode, we get to know him as Moreno. Yeah, a, so Moreno, um, uh, I have his first name right, uh, written down somewhere, but Isidore Moreno. Yes, and Isidore Moreno is kind of an untrusty kind of back of all trade criminal types. Not Spartacus? Uh, um, Isidore well, Spartacus? Well, <laughs> and one thing... <laughs> Isn't that more of a Miami One thing? thing that bugs me about this, man, he must be terrible at bank robberies because that has got to be the least amount of money I have ever seen. Yeah, he's someone... got this little tiny folder of money and then he's like covered in the bank bag like where it exploded and it was all over him. But it, it just got hit home here. The it's the actor is Martin Ferrero. That's who that's who plays it. In the pilot, just eight episodes ago, not eight, or not even eight, seven episodes ago, we saw him as Trini DeSoto. Here we are, two months later in time, you know, when the show originally aired. He's back as a totally different character, and we just Pretend like we don't know anything. What's amazing is that in this episode, he is not the re- returning actor to play a different character. Mm-hmm. You will find out in later episodes that the actor playing Vanessa McCarthy will also return to play <laughs> someone completely different. Really? Yes. So good. And we get and when she comes back, we get to see some more Tubbs Lovin'. <laughs> oh, God. So, wait a minute wait a minute it, we'll talk about it later in the episode but so Tubbs bones down with the same woman twice <laughs> as two different characters yes as it's two like different characters Miami Vice Inception like what so, <laughs> yes you know what you know what though they had to be banking on the fact that everybody did uh, a fast forward through the section so nobody knows that he actually <laughs> bowed the same person twice as two different characters because we've all given ourselves that good grace to just fast forward and not have to watch it <laughs> well when we come back from the opening credits after the scene you know they, there's like some veiled jokes in there about how they kind of how he's not a very good criminal you know yeah, yeah it wasn't funny after we get back through the credits we go to the precincts and they're giving a rundown on Izzy is is what he goes by. He's had three prior, prior felonies, and he's just basically given up anyone and everything. And so they decide, and he also happens to know Lewis McCarthy, who is the bad guy in this episode. That's who Tubbs and Crockett are ultimately trying to go after in this episode. So they're going to use Izzy to, because he's able to give them information that a deliver a new delivery is co- is coming in. We quickly leave from there, and, and but, but, by the way, in that scene. Is he still there? He's covered in the bank bag. He has got like the highest high waters. Oh he, my he, gosh. They're like to his knees. Yeah, they it looks like he's wearing capris. <laughs> also, can I just ask mm-hmm. why, is it mandatory on this show to have white shoes? Like was it a mandatory I mean, because I know that they try to control some things around like only wearing pastels and stuff like that. Because everyone has white shoes in this episode. Yeah, I, I could see so, that for shoes that they would be desperate for because because there was an order that say like no primary colors so you know yeah, that's like, what no. i was gonna say is that uh that was something doing research for this episode that i didn't know but found out is like they completely banned using the color red in any of the episodes because they thought it would be this uh i guess distracting or make you focus too much on it and so like that's why we're very pastel friendly in episodes but you never see colors like red or anything like like bright like that and so, also and no, say, this no is... like brown or black or anything like like they try and stay away from that color as much as possible right i mean yeah, like, and i want to say from... this is one of the only episodes that actually uses the color red 
in it. So it was like exclusively banned from the set. And yet Castillo stands out in like contrast, right? Because he's always in that dark ass suit with his little mini tie. <laughs> but it's the white shoes just drives me crazy. Everybody has them. I don't yep. know. I don't know anyone that has that many white shoes now. It, they anyway, probably it was just really use distracting. them all up on set. And so that's why you can't get them anymore because they just don't make them anymore. They, they use them all. <laughs> well, we leave from just, there and we get to like I one just of my... Really quick. I just... Maybe this is different with police departments now, but... Can I just throw a name out there? Uh, I know Bob Sanders. <laughs> I can get you Bob Sanders. Like, yeah. Is that going to get me jail time reduced? Because they clearly have no idea who this Lewis McCarthy is. For some reason, like you just throw a name out there and that's going to get you off on whatever you're doing wrong, apparently. The <laughs> Miami Vice don't care because what's going to happen is is that they're going to go shoot and kill the bad guy and then you're going to get killed in the process. So hopefully you gave them a good name because everyone's going to die no matter what. We go from that quick scene at the precinct. We get to what, probably my second favorite scene of this episode. We go Oceanside. Here we have three men sitting together at a table and they're watching. They're, they're, they're having brunch. It's clearly brunch. It's during the day. They're sipping champagne. They're sitting out. It's a nice breezy day on the on the coast of Miami. They're looking out into the ocean and they're watching someone drive a boat in circles. Driving fancy, I guess. Like just driving around in the marina doing circles. Then Tubbs starts to talk from the side and the camera pans over and it's Tubbs playing his undercover undercover self. He's there to like go talk to these guys and he's trying to figure out what I want to say here. He is trying trying to introduce himself to these guys. And so these guys are just sitting there. One of them ends up being McCarthy. The person also sitting next to him was Gifford. And then some schmo that just gets out of the table when Tubbs comes over to come talk to McCarthy. They are <laughs> sitting together and they're watching McCarthy's boat just turn circles and do fancy tricks in the marina. And Tubbs' whole point there is to point out Crockett, who is also driving his boat out in the marina, even fancier out in the marina trying to get McCarthy's attention. Kind of like, you know, someone standing on the street corner. He's Crockett's got one leg up. He's like, eh, interested boys. <laughs> See what I have over here. Uh-huh. And that's what they use to get a conversation with McCarthy. Hey, Crockett See, has perfect always have hair people, he's driving that boat. Well, I always have other people drive my boat around for my amusement. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... I, I, I understand completely. You know, it's one of my favorite brunch activities. And that's actually. what my question is in this scene. It's like, so the Crockett and Tubbs, their whole plan was that they're going to go drive their boat, drive Crockett's fast boat really fancy out in the marina to get McCarthy's attention, right? What was McCarthy and Gifford doing? Were they there just watching a performance by someone else drive McCarthy's boat? They were brunching at the weekend at Bernie's house, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they my- just ca- catching some nice late morning breeze off the water. So the one thing that jumps out to me with this scene is that apparently, once again, all it takes to go undercover in Miami is to have a nice speedboat. Just can't figure uh, figure out why this drug dealer, who clearly has speedboats of his own, well, would yeah, care. He's, a- he's supposed to got like the fastest speedboat, right? You know, that's yeah, why he's out there he's watching supposed- someone turn tricks in the marina in his boat because he's like, God damn, I got a fucking nice boat. Yeah, so how is, how is, hey, we have a nice boat too, intrigue him into selling him, does he say, uh, 150 kilos? Um, yeah. Like, like, why would he uh, need to do business with Tubbs and Crockett at all? Yeah, I don't know. Now, let, let me reset this scene, though, because they, I, I kind of glossed over my, I went straight to my favorite part, which is people just doing tricks in boats out in the marina, then people watching from the sideline. It's very confusing. I don't understand what the hell is going on in this scene. But the important thing is, is that, and, and this is weird too. So Tubbs goes to talk to McCarthy. And the reason why he's talking to him isn't necessarily just because they're, he immediately starts to talk about selling or buying drugs. They first talk about doing a boat race, that he wants to end on a boat race. And McCarthy's like, no, I'm not interested. You have, I'm not interested in any ringers. He thinks is he sees Crockett's boat as being too fast. He's he's it's too good of a boat. He doesn't want anything to do with it because these guys just came out of nowhere. He sees the boat out in the marina. He's like, nah, you guys are ringers. I'm not interested. But he does invite them to come watch the race on Sunday. I don't know what day of the week this is supposed to be, but you know, it's a few days from now. And so Tubbs and Crockett, they do what they can to get into this race and then also try and set up McCarthy on a drug deal. But I think in this scene, the only thing that they're able to, to that the only angle they're working right now is to get in 
and get to to get into the race. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's kind of funny because he's you know he doesn't want to deal with he's not looking to uh, bring any ringers in. Yet throughout this entire episode, Tubbs and Crockett constantly are ringers. They're showing off. They're trying to get them to let them into the race and then uh then crockett uh runs the table playing pool pool shark mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then somehow they get into the race and when the race is ringers so <laughs> yeah. um something tells me that Dorothy should have stuck with his uh instincts there told them to uh f off but so so they don't end up getting a lot accomplished uh, other than the invite to watch the race right but they do see someone who's familiar so when Tubbs gets back into the boat with crockett crockett like winds by the the dock and picks him up they decide to go pay this friend a visit right yeah so they know him they call him gifford and that's you know that's i shouldn't say they call him Gifford. that's his name gifford is this guy he's sitting, uh, he's sitting to the left of mccarthy they they rec- when Tubbs jumps into the boat, he's like, and Crockett's like, is that Gifford? And he's like, sure is. Like, let's go pay him a visit. They go. So with this next scene that we jump to is at Gifford's office. Tubbs and Crockett just come like barging in, and that and we find out that Gifford is actually an informant for the Miami Vice. They they they've used him for clients before, but he just said that he didn't turn McCarthy in this time because he didn't think McCarthy was doing anything illegal. Right. Yeah. Because he's kind of boning up with Vanessa, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, so they ask to look at the books, right? And then they see what appears to be a, a strange couple line items, and that's yeah, and, Vanessa's, and at first, right? Crockett thinks that it's because uh, Gifford is taking money from McCarthy, but it ends up not being that. It's that Vanessa, McCarthy's girlfriend, is taking money out on the side and keeping it for herself to the tune of like, Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So of course, of course, when they hear there's a skirt involved, the duo hops in their Ferrari and goes cruising over to the clothing store that supposedly McCarthy funnels all of his money through. This is where Vanessa works, and so she's been taking the money. They're going to go introduce themselves to her, and they're going to go over the clothing store that McCarthy funnels all of his money through. At this clothing store, it's supposed to be like a high end men's fashion clothing store. So we're talking like there's people there that'll bring you drinks. You know, you can spend all day and spend thousands of dollars on clothes at this store. Vanessa comes down to meet and immediately, immediately you're like, oh God, Tubbs is going to try and seduce this woman. He's because got he's something. total heart eyes all over her. He's practically <laughs> drooling. And what makes it so funny is that Crockett is like trying not to crack. Like he's trying not to laugh because he looks so freaking ridiculous and he knows instantly like oh great now yeah. Tubbs is going to be chasing his dick for the whole rest of the episode <laughs> I mean uh, uh, that's a oh, what gets me what gets me is how terrible Vanessa's fashion sense is she's wearing the ugliest green slash robe is that <laughs> it, it, is it a robe wearing yeah. um just it's just awful yeah it's just you know, awful I, I don't know man i have a hard time talking about that because the clothes in the 80s were just so awful in general and you know to be honest with you i was a teenager in the 90s and we ain't much better you know i look at like things like party of five and melrose place now and like oh god is that what we looked like i get that but i mean in it in a later scene she's wearing a silver suit with a green <laughs> with an off green undershirt i'm I, mean, I swear to God, throughout this episode, she looks like Tina Turner meets the Golden Girls. And this this scene is only important because we see that Tubbs is just going to throw himself at Vanessa. And Vanessa is totally down with it. She is all about Tubbs. So at the end of that episode, they just determined that because they want to have another meeting, that Vanessa invites them to go have brunch. So we go to brunch. The duo's there. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Just real quick. Did anyone notice... That they're supposedly to get new suits for tubs. How exactly are they paying for these super expensive suits? They do some money shenanigans, especially in this episode, right? Where later they take money that was captured in a drug bust by Gina. They use that to pay to, for their entry into the boat race. So, I mean, there is some money shenanigans going on. Absolutely. They also aren't, they don't necessarily like explicitly state that he buys anything. He could always put something on hold and like not pick it up. You put them all on layaway? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, I mean, I just, I feel like Vanessa's a smart enough cookie to know when the conversation is not just because he's some, you know, he's he's in there to buy suits. They're yeah. asking a lot of pointed questions. Well, mm. when we when we jump from there, we go straight, straight, straight to bunch. 
Both Crockett and Tubbs are there, and McCarthy and Vanessa are there because they're supposed to be a couple, right? We learned that Vanessa is from, we learned from Gifford that Vanessa is his girlfriend and that they're supposed to be an item. But clearly at brunch, Tubbs and Vanessa, I mean, it's, it, if there weren't other people around, they'd probably throw everything off the table and start boning right on that table. Like, right. They are totally into each other. I I definitely, like, my notes say so swingers. Because, like, <laughs> yeah. I was getting real uncomfortable. I don't understand how everybody else is sitting at that table not uncomfortable. Yeah, because McCarthy's like, he's just kind of smirking watching it happen. This scene is a, is a short scene. The most important thing that comes out of this is that while... Vanessa and Tubbs are like basically fingering each other at the table. Crockett and McCarthy go decide to do real business, and they go walking out, and they go walk out near the near the marina that's out the back of M- McCarthy's house. And Crockett makes an offer to buy 150 kilos of drugs, but McCarthy says no. He's not because he doesn't trust them yet. But he invites him to come to a party at his house that night. They're they're making headway. They're still able to stay in with McCarthy, but they haven't been able to do get him on any anything that they can bust him on yet. And as, so basically, mm-hmm. to summarize: Crockett, uh, Crockett, McCarthy walk the dock, and Crockett turns to him and goes, "Can we buy drugs from you?" Yeah, and McCarthy's like, "Maybe." I mean, I don't trust you yet, but maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, and so b- what, before what I scene, like I like his right. After this scene, uh, Crockett and Tubbs together, and Crockett's lecturing Tubbs about, hey, you know, I see the way you're looking at Vanessa. Don't get caught up in that. Tubbs yeah. is like, I'm a cop. I don't sleep with uh, with sus. And I'm thinking in my head, <laughs> you slept all with you like guys do is sleep with. So far. Yeah. Like, is it that all you and uh, Crockett do is sleep with people who are suspects? Well, now, hold on. Crockett only sleeps with Gina or his ex-wife. But Tubbs has slept with potentially Trudy, uh, because it it seemed like they were hitting at that in the beginning. But then he's slept with, like, almost every other person, like, every other female who's been attached to the crimes that they're pursuing. And let's make the story clear uh, at this point. So, on a side side note, can Trudy get more... In two lines per episode. <laughs> She's like, is that there. too much to ask? She's getting there. I swear you know, to God. Gina, Gina's, I think there's the scene later where they show them doing the bust. I think that's like we're stepping into showing them as real good police officers, right? You know, up until then, they've mm-hmm. kind of been mm-hmm. side characters, but that scene really shows because, like, because Gina chases down the suspect and stuff like that. Like, we're getting there. We're getting there, John. Okay. I just- <laughs> I just want to throw some love to female Tubbs. Feel like she's getting neglected throughout this series, you know? Oh, she totally is. Right. Like, even when, it, like, her and Gina get some action, like, some TV time, it's all Gina all the time. Gina runs the show. Gina controls the conversation. Even when, even when Trudy has a line in the show, it's like when she starts to say it, it's like everyone's ignoring her, the scene. <laughs> it's like she starts to say Say something, and everyone's kind of looking away, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah." Next scene. Well, let's make the story. Let's let's set the plot straight so far right now. Okay, here's the plot: Tubbs and Crockett are trying to infiltrate McCarthy by getting to be allowed to participate in his race, and maybe if in that race they're able to convince them that they are trustworthy, they will be able to buy drugs from him. That's the plot so far in this story. Now we have a secondary plot where Tubbs is so is locked in on trying to get to Vanessa. But otherwise, our plot is our boys want to be in a boat race with a criminal. Right. <laughs> yes. And and that's it, what what's great about this is that uh, they're just trying so desperately just to get into this boat race that they haven't even come. They haven't even figured out how drugs are going to play to to any of this. Like no. They have, haven't set up like how how they how they're gonna bring down this guy's drug empire through this boat race. All they care about right now is just let us race our boat with you. There's never a point in time in this episode where it ever actually makes sense why a guy who does boat racing uses boat races to smuggle drugs. I'm sorry, but there's never a point in time where that makes any sense. And by the end of this episode, it still doesn't make any sense. So. There's never, there's never a point in time in this episode where they are informed that he uses the boat race to smuggle drugs. At yeah. this entire episode, it us the boat 
drinks. There's no drugs involved until the very end of the episode. And some, for some reason, they decide in the middle of the race that this is a perfect time to go collect their drugs. And, you know, before we get to the party, everyone's favorite scene from this episode, they even go sneak on to mccarthy's boat and they can't find where he would hide the drugs in the boat there's never a point in time where there's any hint other than is he saying that he knows mccarthy sells drugs other than that there's no hint that mccarthy actually sells drugs even with crockett being like can i buy some drugs from you he still says no so yeah. so far there's no re- there's no way reason why these guys should suspect that they're selling drugs let's get to the party let's get to the part that everyone wants to talk about let me let me set the scene uh-huh. Let me set the scene. We come back to it's nighttime now. The duo is already inspecting McCarthy's boat. They get dressed up in their fanciest clothes. Tubbs is wearing a very nice pants with a white shirt with ink stains all over it, unbuttoned down to his belly button, showing the great man turf that is Tubbs' chest. Crockett is wearing an amazing black blazer with a green shirt underneath, which later we find out has no sleeves it's just it's like a green it's like a green bib that he's wearing underneath his black blazer the house is a is a great 80s house very square modern glass on the ra- for the railing music is playing at the party and people are dancing now when i say people i mean there's white people eddie eddie murphy white people dancing happening everywhere all over the patio we come into the party and we see the 80s cover, the band, the cover band that's playing at the party. And I will let Jenna kick off the, some of the descriptions on this cover band and the great dancing that is taking place inside of this party. Okay, so <laughs> I really feel like our dad is misunderstood, okay? Like, people enjoy watching him dance, but everybody thinks that maybe his dance moves are a little crazy and (laughs) let me tell you this was an eye-opening experience for me because i feel like he maybe choreographed this whole scene um (laughs) they have like the end time step step clap going on with like the the saxophone players and the saxophone (laughs) players are like they're singing but only the partially balding curly haired wedding singer looking guy is actually singing but halfway through he switches to playing guitar and one of the saxophone players becomes the lead singer all while karate kid is playing the drums in the back (laughs) so i just i don't think it gets any better than this this is this is the best that that i've ever seen and they've got one guy who's like like a freddie mercury lookalike who's he keeps like pirouetting in front of the screen every time that they pan across the room of people dancing he like comes in and like does like a a slick like michael jackson turn and then walks off the screen it's perfect. Okay, so just really quick, cool, and I'll get in the more depth when we go to the music section of this episode, but three of the four songs in this episode are played during this scene. Two of the three of those songs were actually performed by that band. Mm. Uh, so it, they're instead a real of band. the artist, they're a real band. They actually, instead of using the artist version of the song that they're, uh, they just had the real band cover them, the real house band. And I want to know what happened to these guys. Is there a biography I can read about it? I want to know what happened to the Miami Vice house band. Yeah, yeah. Where's Um, the behind the music on this band? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. This band is amazing. I want to know what happened. My my favorite part of this of this scene. Now, there's there's things that happen to it. I want to continue talking about the party. My favorite things that happen in this scene is 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 there's the band, there's the dancing, and then there's the people. I see them as three totally separate things. One is the band. The band is like a mix. Like if you were to get one famous person from a bunch of different popular bands and all put them together, get their lookalikes to all be together in a single band, that's these guys. There's like one Rick James. There's one Freddie Mercury. There's a guy dressed up like Karate Kid. There's like, Bam Bam <laughs> by the craft food table. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And then that's the same thing with the they people. They have a fireman. They have a say. Sa- they have a fireman, they have a sailor, but they're, for some reason they're missing a f- American. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. And that's the same thing with the people who are out dancing. There's a Billy Idol. There's a Cindy Lauper. There's like, I mean, it, it's almost like they're parroting the 80s. They're parroting the era that they live in because there's like people, it looks, it, it seriously looks like a costume party. That the way everyone is dressed, the, the house is like, 
the epitome of like an 80s house. There's like awkward cut art on pink walls angled. You know, the bar looks like a giant seashell. You know, there's just everything you could imagine in like a great comedy about the 80s. They're living this for real in this episode. And then the music. Oh, it, okay, okay, let's talk about the band for just a second, okay? Because the, the, the guys in the band are terrible. They suck. Like, I want to know what happened to this uh, band, but uh-huh. it's also because they suck. How did they ever land this gig? I don't know. And this, this is the other thing that gets me about this house band, is that I've been doing the music for these episodes for the entire time we've been doing this. And the one thing I've noticed consistently is that sometimes, instead of using the artist version of the song, they use the house band. It's the same house band in every episode, from what I can tell. So I am just blown away. Where did these guys come from, and how come I cannot get any information on where they went? <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and watch now. So that's episode three, right? Where, oh, uh, no, it's in it's in the s- s- second half of the pilot. It, where they go see where Tubbs walks across the dance floor. He goes to see Calderon, and there's that house band playing. I'm going to have to go back and watch that scene and see if it's the same guys. Oh, I hope it is. I'm pretty sure it is because every time I do uh, research about the music, they refer to the Miami Vice house band as exactly that. It's the Miami Vice house band. They don't refer uh. to it as print bands. It's the same house band. I love that this show has its own house band. Yeah, that would be amazing if it is the same guys. All right, all right, all right. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) Back on track with this story. The story part of this of this party is they Tubbs goes and he talks to Vanessa. You know, as soon as he gets there, right? That's what he's going to do because he's only got one thing in mind. But Gifford is also there too. He sees Tubbs and Crockett talking to Vanessa, and he pulls Vanessa aside. He asks her to go dance and pulls him aside. They're clearly going to go have a conversation. Gifford obviously knows who these guys are. Izzy is also there too, and he's like eating or like trying to light someone's cigarette. Kind of like someone who looks like Brigitte Nielsen. So another cosplay kind of person that's appearing at this party and they go they walk through they walk downstairs they find mccarthy mccarthy is in the middle of telling story playing pool and crockett is just this, asking this, him, is, this is where crockett has to be crockett to be the trying desperately to be the coolest guy there oh he is ferrari far. oh yeah he bets his ferrari against uh uh mccarthy just so that he could show off how good at pool he is. Yeah, well, the, and what, in doing what he wants so, to do is he wants to get into the race, right? So he offers his Ferrari to be able to get into the race. He's going to challenge McCarthy to a game of pool. Who had just beaten the last person on the table, and the guy said he didn't even get a shot. Yeah, and of course, Crockett being the ever so cool, uh, especially when he takes off his jacket and you realize that green shirt is actually <laughs> cut off yeah. sleeves. <laughs> he's got he's to give himself some more range, okay? That... that that jacket's too limiting. Yeah, I mean, it was uh-huh. okay. It was like I, I dropped everything that I was doing. I was like, oh my god, that shirt doesn't have any sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> the person that dresses them for this episode must really like that color green too, because we've seen it twice. Vanessa up to this that awful green color. Now we've seen it on Crockett with the sleeveless shirt. And we see it on Tubbs uh, and Vanessa again later in the episode. So that off green, that ne- lime green color um must have just been bees knees at that point in the 80s or something yeah. bees knees okay dad <laughs> i'm trying to be cool at crockett <laughs> <laughs> of course crockett goes and runs the table on mccarthy right he wins the pool game he's gonna get into the race they've, they've done their job now they're gonna get into this race and at the end of the game sunny and rico are gonna leave you know and crockett tells them like Hey, all right, I'm taking, you know, like, I'm going to go do other stuff. Uh, don't you get too busy with Vanessa now. You know, don't uh, don't get in too, too deep with that. And Tubbs like, ah. Crockett goes upstairs. He's having some food and drink. He's, he sees a lady. He wants to go talk to the lady. Meanwhile, bam, Tubbs bam. And, meanwhile, Tubbs and Vanessa are slow dancing it on the dance floor. And sticking they're each other's like tongues down in each other's throats. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh god, and it was so gross. It's like like you you're adults. This is for sure not the first time that you've kissed anyone, and yet it looks like the first time that you've ever made out with anybody. They're like swallowing each other's faces. And I've gotta believe that since Tub is the consistent factor here that it's him. That this yeah. is just what he does. That's just how he does things. It's gross. Guy, 
his lips has got to be outside of your lips, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I really, I fear for all of the youth from the 80s that were watching these television programs and thinking like, oh, okay, that's, I gotta, I can, I can kiss this girl. I just have to like, <laughs> Just get a lip under her chin and one up by the, ne- <laughs> by the nose, and then I just like wiggle my tongue around. <laughs> her mouth. But, and I like I like hold her by the shoulder so she can't get away. <laughs> it's so bad. Well, Croc is watching all this and having a good laugh as he sees that this is what's happening with Tubbs and Vanessa. Well, and Even McCarthy though- is like got that the like the soon meme look going on as he's yeah. sitting on the other side of the sliding glass door yeah, watching yeah, so this he's happen. watching it the other way which you get the feeling from earlier that mccarthy didn't really care but now it seems like he does care so i don't know what the hell's going on between Tubbs and vanessa it's very confusing so but, and mm-hmm. this is something this is something that we find out later uh there's something we find out later during this scene this is the last time we see gifford alive yeah because and I- izzy is trying to talk to sunny and then there's a scream and everyone goes running outside and they pull gifford's body out, out, out of the water he's been shot he's dead and we learn later that what the reason why is because he was saying that vanessa wanted to leave him and because she was leaving him gifford was going to go tell mccarthy and so he ends up dead. Yes. Oh wow! I didn't real. I, yeah. I don't know how. In my watching this twice, I did not pick up that that's how he ended up dead. But good to yeah. know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So pretty much, he is shot and killed. At the same time, Vanessa is getting ready to bone down a few minutes later with Tubbs. Cold. You know, that's how the party scene ends. And I, I almost regret that that scene ended. I kind of wish that the episode would just take place for the rest of the time inside of that house while all those people were dancing. But unfortunately, we have to move on. We go back to the precinct. You know, there's kind of little jump scenes here that are going on. The big one is, is that back at the, at the precinct, Castillo was telling the boys, like, so the boys are telling them, like, hey, we got into the race. And Castillo's like... I can't help you, man. We I didn't get the money from downtown. I don't believe in your boating skills. Even after all that fancy driving in the marina that Crockett did <laughs> earlier in the episode, they still don't think he can win this race. Crockett not only owns a boat, but he also lives on one, and they don't <laughs> believe that he can properly win a, a boat race. I'm, it's yeah. just ridiculous. But he does tell the so, duo... Th- not to distract away from, from the episode recap, but apparently this... Uh, uh, Apparently, Don Johnson actually did race boats a little bit in the 80s. Of course so, he did. Outside of being Crockett, he actually did race speed boats a little bit. Like, that was a hobby of his. Do so you I have a feeling Don why. Johnson just wanted to be Sonny Crockett? Like, he legitimately wanted to be him? The more and more I read about Don Johnson, that is the truth. Is that Don Johnson really wanted to be Crockett, and... He and everything that makes up Crockett and this amazing character is just coming straight from Don's fantasies of what of the the person he the action hero he wants to be in real life. But if he raced boats before, how come he wasn't driving the boat during the racing scene at the end of this episode? Zito's driving the I boat. I don't know. That that's what I can't figure out because in doing research, I actually did Race boats from uh, in the early eighties, like a little bit, like like wow. uh, like you could totally see his real life. Johnson's real life was bleeding over into this dirt that he wanted to be so bad. In this case, like they got into the race, and Castillo can't help him out with the money. What he says, he didn't get them the money from downtown, but he can help them with the money. And Gina and Trudy are about to bring down a college professor who's selling one kilo of coke and they can go get like so they could do this money shenanigans where they can take the money from that go use it to buy into the race and then when they win the race you put that money back in the evidence locker this is actually the lieutenant that is suggesting that this is what these guys do and see this this whole part of the episode this whole scene just felt like filler to me it felt like all of this was completely unnecessary to the plot of the episode why do we care where the hell they get the money for this has nothing to do other than just to give Judy and Gina five minutes in of time in the episode of being looking like they're legitimate cops well but it's not just Trudy and Gina because Zito and Switek are there too like it's it's a nice check in with all the other fringe characters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this they is all, what they everyone else is doing. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, let's go <laughs> to that drug bust scene because so the Crockett and Tom's shape that they're gonna go meet with 
Gina and Trudy. The sales are about to go down. They're going to go bust it. The plan is, is that Crockett is going to take the money right from there. They're going to, and then they're going to go enter into the boat race. Show up. Gina and Trudy are inside of a hotel room. They're waiting for this college professor guy who's still in the coke. Who knows why? We don't have any backstory on why any of this is happening. They're waiting for him to show up. So Crockett and Tubbs are there. So are Zito and Switek. Switek is working behind the bar. Zito's, of course, he's the guard. That's his undercover role on this. Which is like, it's constantly amazed at like what they come up with with the other roles for the police officers to do while they're there. And this is another attempt for the Miami Vice writers at some comedy because they have Zito talking to... Uh, a girl in a bathing, an attractive woman in a bathing suit at the pool. None of it is funny, but they at least attempted. I guess he's gonna blind someone. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then uh, who was Switek saying? I was the one on the high school swim team. Yeah, like okay, Seth Rogen. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. Can well, I just ask, like, why Gina is always dressed like she's trying out for Greece? I think they're. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think what they're what I think what it's supposed to be right in this bust, and probably in all the ones that they do otherwise, is like she's supposed to be playing like a young woman and like trying to use that to be like. Then these older men think they're like trying to take advantage of her. Yeah, so but like, she doesn't ever change. Like she's never wearing anything different. She's always wearing that white polo and the pink poodle skirt. Yeah, except for in the pilot. Remember in the pilot, they're dressed like hookers. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's what. And so in this scene. They're sitting on the bed. The professor comes in. He's like, you know, obviously someone who doesn't sell a lot of drugs is a really bad conversation between them about how he can't wait to, you know, they're not going to have any problems passing his class next semester. And then Gina pulls out her badge, says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm a cop. And then he just runs out, like, and it turns into this chase scene where Gina trying to ch- Gina and Trudy and Switek are trying to chase down this professor as he runs out of the hotel room, which ends up being a really bad chase scene too because he's clearly running really slowly. And well, like pumping his arms fast, but he's moving really slowly. That way, Gina can catch up to him on the beach. But mm. I think the important mm. thing here was that they're trying to show that Gina is a good cop. Like she, the, Gina and Trudy did this bust, and then Gina like hauled ass to chase them down and tackled them on the beach and, and and arrested him. That hotel, by the way, looks almost exactly like the hotel that we stayed at in Costa Rica. They probably filmed so many porns inside of that hotel room that they did that, that they shot the scene at. Oh, probably. And mm-hmm. what got me too was that when Zwitek was running, he was wearing such tight white pants. It looked like he had a real hard time running. Like he couldn't bend his knees. <laughs> so he was kind of robot running to keep up with them. Well, they catch the, they catch the professor out on the beach. They pull up. They still have the briefcase and Sonny and Crockett are walking up like, we'll take that. And then they give, they tell Gina what's happening basically. They're going to use it to buy in and that they're going to get the money back. Luckily for them, I mean, of course, Crockett has a great relationship with Gina, so she's okay with it, even though she's personally responsible for this money making it back into the evidence locker. So Trudy the plan looks is, so offended by the oh, way yeah. that Gina totally just just crumbles for him. Exactly, and I mean, think about the plan here. Like, we're going to enter a boat race with stolen money from the evidence locker, but trust me, we're going to win this race, and so you'll get the money back. I'm sure Trudy would have protested, but they don't let her talk. <laughs> Let's just jump to the very, very, very painful love scene between Tubbs and Vanessa that yes. comes very that comes next. Yes. Painful and is right. What room are they in? This. Yeah, so it must be next day. The race is going to happen next day. Crockett's going to go do an use the money to also go do an upgrade on the boat. That way, it'll be faster, and they can guarantee that 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 they're going to win. At that night, Gina and Crockett. Oh, sorry, that's later. That that night, Tubbs and Vanessa. Tubbs is staying at Vanessa's house and she has a very nice purple room with like what looks like a jungle theme bed frame that goes around her bed. I feel like bed. they were like inside yeah. of a clamshell. It was <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> and is this like a theme suite or something? Yeah. I mean, it, it's like it's like you know welcome to Atlantis yeah, you know style bedroom. In order for Tubbs again, to enter, he had to be dressed as Tarzan. And then, and then again, uh, like it's it's as though neither of them has ever done this before. That they both you just imagine have like stripped down to a certain degree and then gotten into the bed together and are looking at each other like, okay, how do we do we just start or <laughs> do I lean into you? Is this where you kiss me? Where do I put my hands? What's up with yeah. this? Like it just looks so awkward. Okay, so we're we're in this room. They're both laying in bed. We just we just hard jumped straight to this scene where they're both in bed like this. Okay, Jenna, 
You described the it's last. It's very moist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We just you described the last sex tubs sex scene. How would you describe what is happening in this a uh, new sex scene with Tubbs and Vanessa? So they've clearly learned their lesson, right? Because aside from the first couple painful moments of leaning in and like seeing them come together, they fully zoom out and everything's kept very far away because they know that nobody wants to see this in detail, but it's like painfully slow. The way that it moves, like, they don't just go from, like, kissing to fondling and all of a sudden, like, bam, yeah, they're getting down. That's not how it works. You end up watching, like, a good five minutes, which in television time is a long time to be just staring at the same scene while they're just starting to make out with each other and, like, very casually starting to to, to do the deed. But it's, like, really slow and, and awkward I don't know that moist is right. But we'll you can tell. Like tubs Has is it, always moist. Tubs you can is tell always that Tubbs of... doesn't know what to do with his hands, too. He keeps, like, shifting them around. And you, right. have, you see, like, he wants to touch her in mm-hmm. certain areas, but it's TV, so he can't. Yeah. You know? And and he's, like, he's he's like a carpet <laughs> on his chest <laughs> and his stomach. So I feel like that must attract a lot of whatever the, whatever the coconut body oil is that he uses because he's always got that kind of sheen to him. I don't, the whole thing about it is just makes me want to wash my hands. It just seems very <laughs> gross. Has, it, has <laughs> it ever been okay for cops to sleep with people during act that are involved in active investigations? I kind of feel like that's always been taboo, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing, too. Is like, I don't know. I don't think they're supposed to, right? The, the department doesn't talk about it, but they're not supposed to. So right. if it becomes a routine problem, someone needs to step in. And this is, you know, person number two that Tubbs is not only is he having sex with them, but he is like falling in love with them, right? Yeah. Can we also talk about that? Yeah. Like how Tubbs, it, Tubbs is like a schoolboy that he like literally cannot make out with someone without all of a sudden being head over heels. He basically fell in love with Vanessa while she walked down the stairs in her shop where he just saw her and was like this is gonna be it this is it for me guys forever (laughs) i'm not being a cop anymore i'm Uh, gonna get married (laughs) i will raise children out in the woods Um, we're gonna buy we're gonna buy a farm and i'll be raising children out on the farm and right like later on when he has to confront vanessa about some of the other things end up coming to light it's as though you imagine that he's had the ring in his pocket for the whole episode (laughs) and now he's having to face the idea that like they're not gonna be able to to be together anymore and i just i just can't like i can't get behind that at all like at least with crockett he's like that casual playboy and sticks to a couple women and like he has a growing relationship with both of them so it makes sense when he has his feelings but Tubbs just sort of goes zero to 60 so it totally negates the whole like i'm a playboy and i'm so cool and look at all these women because it's like are you still a virgin <laughs> <laughs> okay part of me is okay serious. let's Wonder. get to my favorite let, let's get to my favorite part of the episode the actual boat race in which Tubbs and crockett are in giant orange jumpsuits <laughs> wearing bomber helmets <laughs> which okay. by the way this, no, it, the orange jumpsuits are see-through so at the end of the race, when they get out of the boat, you can see through the – so they're only wearing, like, like boy shorts and, like, white beaters <laughs> underneath that orange jumpsuit. You can – it's totally see-through. Yeah. Am I the only one saw the boat race and immediately envisioned, like, those old cartoon network – Oh, it's wacky um, races all the way. Wacky races. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This is it is it's it's wacky races. It's everyone's in an orange everyone's in, in their different color jumpsuits, each team. Each team is wearing these bomber helmets. I just and wish. somewhere there is a dog laughing under his breath while the evildoer plays with his mustache. Right. Like, I just wish that they had Elvis in the scene and just did, like, a weird zoom in on him. And he did, like, the, the he, he, that the dog would normally do. <laughs> yes. Because I feel like that's what I was waiting for. Oh, my God. I yes. That's the most amazing visual. <laughs> 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 it would be so good. Well, thank you, the, thank the, you, Jenna, because I thought I was the only one that was seeing the wacky races. Oh, absolutely! In, in this scene, that was exactly it. Well, let's let's set the scene right. The the boat race is <laughs> McCarthy comes walking out. He's got a helmet on, so you can't see his face. The crowd's cheering for him. He goes down to the boat. They're getting ready to start the race. Zito and Zwitek are out, and Castillo. No, sorry, Zwitek and Castillo are out on a boat. 
away from the race. They're, they're out stationed, wa- watching it. Tubbs and Crockett haven't shown up yet. The race is going to start. The, the announcer says, like, we don't know who boat, where boat number five is. They say, like, screw it. We're just going to start without them. Anyway, it's a rolling start. The boats come rolling up. And then they go, and they're going to go out to an arbitrary point where there's this other, like, yacht where they go around the yacht, and, th- and then they come back. This is a real race. This isn't, like, some staged thing where there's, it's all about drug smuggling. This is a real race. There's fans there that, that, that are there to watch it. There's, like, uh, officials there, everything. This is a real boat race. And we have great aerial videography of, of this race that's happening through, that goes all around the Miami area, apparently. And so the Tubbs and Crockett come pulling up late. And, of course, when they come pulling up, this uh, Born to be Wild starts playing on screen. And they're gonna they're driving a badass boat. But they're actually driving it. Zito's actually driving the boat. And Tubbs and Crockett are just kind of there. Yeah, random. Like extra yeah. weight <clears throat> in the boat, I guess? I don't know. It's weird. But yeah, they're like late to the boat race and, and all and of a sudden you hear Born just, to be Wild start up and they just like are are blasting past everybody. And for those of you who are trying to follow the plot line, don't. Because <laughs> at this point, we still have no idea what this race has anything to do with drugs. Yeah, there's no actual input on like why why would a guy who's who's clearly a famous boat racer because there's a bunch of people there that know who he is and they're cheering him when he gets onto the boat is is using the boat race to smuggle drugs. And so halfway through the race, they put together, it looks like McCarthy's boat like falls back and then disappears and then reappears out in front of them. And Crockett and Tubbs put together that it's a different boat that looks identical. And the boat that was started the race didn't have the drugs on it. But the boat now that just came into the race does have the drugs on it. They radio into Castillo to say, it's that boat now. You're good to go. That one's actually got drugs on it. Now we're just going to win this race. Zito throws it into high gear and we have a great montage. You know, not montage, but like a race cut to go to the to, to, to the end of the race. But let's talk about that for a second. Like, does it make any sense? How does that make sense yeah, for smuggling drugs? About this, let's think about this logically. We are going to, during the mo- the very public, very public race, they are going to drive their boat away from the crowd, get into a new test drugs in it, drive that boat back into the race like no one's going to notice. And that's what? how they are going to smuggle drugs i think what it's supposed to be is that i think what it's supposed to be is that mccarthy has taken one boat that he has two boats that look identical mccarthy is in one boat he went out and picked up drugs and was waiting and hiding the beginning of the race he's not actually in that boat it's someone else that races up to that point and then they and then they don't swap like the people don't change just the new boat the boat that mccarthy was driving with the drugs now pulls out and it's going to go win this race so mccarthy's trying to get both right he's trying to deliver drugs and get the money for winning a race but uh, why yeah why use the race at, at all to smuggle drugs how yeah. uh use it, how is smuggling drugs while everyone is watching you race the best way to smuggle drugs rather than doing it say in the middle of the night when no one's around two how do tubs and crockett figure out about the boat switching and the drugs like how did all of a sudden they just oh that's how they smuggle the drugs god because we brought the entire miami police department with us to arrest mccarthy after we win this race, you know, and we would look like idiots if there weren't any drugs here. <laughs> right. <laughs> then it would just be Castillo giving that Castillo stare for no reason. Well, I can, it doesn't make any sense, but this is where the episode goes. Zito throws it in a high gear. We have a close finish, but the, the good guys end up winning the race too, so they get Gino's money back. When McCarthy comes walking off the boat, Castillo and Switek are waiting there to arrest him. They, they bust McCarthy. They're able to get the drugs off the boat. All's L that all's well that ends well. No one died. They didn't kill Izzy. Yeah. They didn't kill McCarthy. Like they okay, got but, their man. But like, but Gifford's dead. Oh yeah, it's true. So it's we true. did. They we actually did not over. make the, out of the episode without someone dying. <laughs> 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 but and, like, they didn't immediately kill the main bad guy in this. Right, so they they got him arrested, and also they weren't terrible undercover police officers. Tubbs and Crockett didn't arrest McCarthy, and now there's another drug dealer in Miami that knows that they are uh, that 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 they are cops. They were able to maintain that they were undercover, and everyone's happy. We go to that night. Tubbs everyone's and happy at the mm-hmm. very end, except at the very end of this episode, for some reason, Marino shows up at Crockett's boat because, of course, he knows where that boat is. Uh, right, where Croc is just too. kicking it with Gina, where Croc 
Fuck is just kicking it with Gina. And brings up, hey, uh, I found this gun. And Vanessa is the murderer. She's the one that killed Gifford. It, he's actually got the gun. Like, he's got he's the gun. He's actually got right. the gun. And, and hold on. Like, first, let's everyone touch the gun. Like, Marino touched the gun, <laughs> handed it to Crockett. Crockett touched the gun. The- touch the gun when crockett eventually approaches tubs about it tubs touch the gun and now that we're positive that we couldn't possibly now have a successful case against vanessa let's have her open the door so that we can tell her that we're arresting her yes it's gonna yeah, go and that's and that's how the episode ends they pull back up crockett goes meets tubs out the crockett and the police go to vanessa's house tubs comes out to meet them crockett gives them a rundown of what's happening T- and so tubs goes walk back in because he's gonna tell her what's happening you know that that they know that it's her that killed him she opens up the door before he's able to make it inside we have a very awkward scene on how it ends where he says like we know that you killed uh gifford and she says like you're not gonna arrest me he's like yeah i am it's my job she's like no you're not he's like yes i am and then the episode ends (laughs) you can't arrest me i'm gonna be back next season as your love interest (laughs) (laughs) that concludes our rundown of this episode this very strange awkward and anti-climatic episode of miami vice it was great appropriately named the great earthy all right let's go on and talk about the music all right john it sounds like you are prepared for this week's music rundown of this episode we actually have music unfortunately it's all bunched together it seems like all in just kind of one area all but i guess fortunately by all in band so we get to talk about the Miami Vice house band a little bit so what do you got for us this week uh-huh. okay so first and fo- foremost let's just get the most obvious song out of the way. Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf, released in 1968, but was used during the boat race. And this song is used, is probably the most used song in movies and television and shows. I must have counted at least over 40 different TV shows, movies, and commercials that this song has been used in. Everything from Barney's Great Adventure, <laughs> Horror Rat. Okay? Can't wait. Can we find the Barney episode that uses this? That's amazing. Oh, not the episode. Barney's Great Adventure, the movie. Barney had a movie? Yep, in 1998 called just, Barney's Great just... Adventure. This just keeps getting better. Yes, it was used in that movie. It was used in Borat. It was also used in Blue Cross commercials in 2011. That's so some range. Jeez. Yes. I don't think I don't think I I I, I seriously was trying to find an exact <laughs> amount of how many times it's used because I believe Born to Be Wild will be the most used song in movies and television out of any song in existence. I don't think I can think of one other one that has been used in more different things than Born to be Wild. So let's get past that and let's get down to the other three songs. And the other three songs were all used during McCarthy's party, the the infamous party scene. And so we have Go Insane, Lindsay Buckingham, which is the first song, which is played while Crockett and McCarthy are playing pool. So the major points to take away from this is that Go Insane is a song by Lindsay Buckingham, who played guitar for Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac. At this point in time, when this song is released, he had left Fleet Mac in, in, to try his own solo career, which about 10 years of this, about 10 years later, he would eventually rejoin Fleetwood Mac. But the song Go Insane is actually very popular because he would later admit that the song is about his relationship or his post breakup relationship with Stevie Nicks. So this is an interesting song where the guitarist for Fleetwood Mac tried to make his own solo career wrote a song about being with Stevie Nicks and uh, eventually would later join the band. But it comes into, we find a lot of times with Miami Vice music is that it, it is stuff like this. It is songs written about artists and having rela- uh, in relationships with other major artists. It's artists trying to go out on their own and start their own solo career. Jump from this song to uh, Some Guys Have All the Luck, which is... is a song originally written and perform uh, originally I'm sorry originally performed by the Persuaders, a 1970 R&B group that was later covered around this time, 1984, by Rod Stewart. The one thing I took away from this is that the guy who wrote this song, a guy named Jeff Gang, he wrote this song in his brief three years 
in the music business after he graduated Yale in 1971. All right. My favorite thing about this guy is that this is the only song he ever sold. All the songs he came out with, aside from several public service radio spots <laughs> on topics of alcoholism and VD. <laughs> I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. This is the only song he ever sold, aside from things about alcoholism and VD. It sounds like he has more experience in the other two than he does about music. Yes. So this guy would later go on to become a clinical psychologist. <laughs> and in 2000... That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And in 2013, he actually released an album of all the songs during that three-year period in the 70s that he wrote but was never able to sell. Mm, <laughs> so, I kind of want to get my hands on that now. Oh, man. I kind of want to also. Just to, just to try and hear how many songs of those are about VD. <laughs> So, a little bit about the Persuaders, um, the people who originally performed this song. It seems like any song the Persuaders ever came out with that was worth a damn was eventually covered by someone a lot more known, being Mm. that this song was later covered by Rod Stewart, and the only other song that they were really popular for was a thin line between love and hate that was later covered by the pretenders i'm so, never gonna remember that now that the per, that the pretenders covered a persuader song <laughs> yeah uh so the one thing the other thing i took away from this is that instead of using the rod stewart version of this song they decided to let the miami vice house band perform their version covered version of this song also instead of using the the Laura Brannigan version of self control which is the which is the next song used during the party they also used the house band's version of that Laura Brannigan to me from what i read she was mostly known for not really for the songs that she performed but for songs that she w- were either covered by other artists or used in other movies. She wrote songs for Flashdance and the Ghost and Ghostbusters in the early oh, wow. 80s. Wow. So the big thing about Laura Branigan is that two of her songs, like two of her very most popular songs, spawned the careers of one Diane Warren and another Michael Bolton. <laughs> really? Yes, her song co-written with Michael Bolton, "How I Am Supposed to Live," "How Am I Supposed to Live Without You," was Michael Bolton's first major hit, and what brought him onto the music scene. So she is responsible for Mike Bolton's music, <laughs> um, which I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I have an immediate dislike of this lady. Yes. So, and then once again, this is not, this is the second or third artist in the uh, Miami Vice music world who has been directly responsible for spawning someone else who's a lot more popular's career. Being that a few episodes ago, we had a song that eventually spawned Whitney Houston's career. We are seeing it is very popular for them to pick music by artists who would eventually go on to help start other very much more popular artists, but then go on to not be all that popular themselves. So last but not least about the music side, and this is a challenge for both both of you, uh, they're also going to work on. We must find out who Miami Vice's house band is and where they are now. That is is my mission for coming weeks. So, and I'm going to leave the, uh, I'm going to end my segment with that. We challenge everyone out there to go find out who this house band is. Let's, Someone uh, please. Let's, uh, that pretty much covers the music. And uh, let's go on to our final thoughts. All right. This episode was a lot of fun. It made no sense. And we also got someone who's going to be a recurring character in Isidore Moreno. Where, who's going to be in many episodes in the coming future this i have to say i'll kick off this week when it comes to the our final thoughts it was fun it was funny it was the you know the the yin and yang of that 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 is miami vice we get the ones that are really serious like last week and then we also get these ones that are kind of silly and it seems like they didn't have enough information to be able to turn this into a whole episode i can't decide 
if at the beginning when the writers are thinking this up if they wanted a boat race episode or if they wanted a vanessa episode so but they decided that they didn't have enough information on either so they had to merge it together into a single episode so i'm not sure uh, in the end what they actually wanted this episode to be but it, you know it ended up being okay it was funny we, it was it was fun to watch so that pretty much sums it up for me john what are your final thoughts on this episode i uh, to be honest with you, I'm just amazed that Martin Farino it played Trino De Soto and in such a short amount of time also played Izzy Marino, who is eventually going to be a reoccurring character on the show. And then you have Maria McDonald, who plays Vanessa uh, McCarthy, who's eventually going to come back as another love interest for Tubbs, Alicia. And I've been racking my brain trying to figure out what other show I can think of where they have used the same actor to play multiple characters throughout the, the length of a show, let alone within five episodes of each other. I just, I, I can't for the life of me. So, I mean, that's, I, I'm just blown away by the writer's willingness to do this. So I guess that for me, other, uh, you know, aside from what you talked about and just the fu- overall fun and just insane plot of this episode, that's the main thing that I'm taking away. When has any other show done this? I, I wish I had some examples for you, John. I, I wish I did. Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So this episode was great for me. I love the, uh, I guess, just the Hallmark moments. First of all, that they brought... Izzy. So Martin Ferrero is back. Um, also, side note, in case anyone wasn't sure who we were talking about, he's the lawyer from Jurassic Park. So uh, I just feel like he was an awesome character. I was excited and waiting for him to be brought back. I know we had mentioned that a few episodes back as well, that, that we knew that he was going to come back up as a more regular character. So uh, I was excited to see him again. And then as a longtime fan of Wacky Races, the whole boat race thing, the whole premise of them wanting to join in on this, the boat race itself, was perfect for me. I thought it was hilarious. Their matching translucent uh, suits, like body suits, was just over the top and hilarious, and I loved it. Um, I don't go into any of these episodes expecting much from a story perspective, so I think that that helped. The fact that like that I really don't think that I'm ever going to get a huge plot to drive at, something that's like really gets me into the into it to care about what's happening in the story. And this episode is in a perfect example of that because if you're really trying to follow the episode, it doesn't make any sense, and it's and it's not that great, you know. But if you're just enjoying like all the little flash moments of crazy, stupid crap, then it's perfect. You get everything that you could want, like when uh, Crockett and Gina are on the boat, and for whatever reason, they just cut to one zoom in of Elvis, and then back to Crockett and Gina. And, like, there's no reason for it. Like, it doesn't help set the scene in any way. Exactly, right? Like, it just seems, like, misplaced and strange, and that was sort of the tone that I took on from the whole episode, was that it was a series of scenes that felt misplaced or out of order or just kind of strange altogether and not helpful to driving what's happening forward. But overall, I thought it was hilarious, and the 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 band and everything was just... It was comedy. This was a funny episode for me, and I, and I enjoyed it. In conclusion, I miss Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for this week with uh, Go With The Heat, your guide to the cultural phenomenon that it was Miami Vice. We uh, hope you're enjoying the show. Make sure to subscribe. And if you're subscribing, you are enjoying the show, make sure you give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. If you want to get a hold of us, you can email us at gowiththeheat at gmail.com. Check out our website, go with it at gowiththeheat.com. You can get us on Twitter, Facebook, or yeah, Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. You can get each of us on Twitter. I'm at Dom Corvo. John is at Corvo underscore John. Jenna is at Jenna A. Barham. Reach out and contact us. We hope you're enjoying the show, and we'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. Bye. Thank you.